السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ أخذنا ميثاق بني إسرائيل لا تعبدون إلا الله وبالوالدين إحسانا وذي القربى واليتامى والمساكين وقولوا للناس حسنا وأقيموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة ثم توليتم إلا قليلا منكم وأنتم معربون وإذ أخذنا ميثاقكم لا تسفكون دماءكم ولا تخرجون أنفسكم من دياركم ثم أقررتم وأنتم تشهدون ثم أنتم هؤلاء تقتلون أنفسكم وتخرجون فريقا منكم من ديارهم تظاهرون عليهم بالإثم والعدوان وإن يأتوكم أسارا تفادوهم وهو محرم عليكم إخراجهم أفتؤمنون ببعض الكتاب وتكفرون ببعض فما جزاء من يفعل ذلك منكم إلا خزي في الحياة الدنيا ويوم القيامة يردون إلى أشد العذاب وما الله بغافل عما تعملون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد Once again everybody السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We are now still dealing with ayah number 83 where Allah Azza wa Jal has taken a covenant from the children of Israel Allah Azza wa Jal says وَإِذَا خَذْنَا مِثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ When we took the binding covenant contract you can call it the commandments in the biblical account the ten commandments I'm sure you've heard the term before لا تعبدون إلا الله you won't be worshipping anyone other than Allah وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And with both parents, nothing short of excellence, the very best that you can do. وَذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ And to those that possess the most closeness, ذِي الْقُرْبَى Which can be translated as relatives, but you can also look linguistically at ذِي الْقُرْبَى as some Mufassirun have, and understood from it people of closeness to you, meaning close friends, associates, people like that. People that are close to you in your life, even if they're not relatives. That you'll be the best to them that you can be as well. وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ And then by extension, we talked about orphans yesterday. وَالْيَتَامَى Who we didn't talk about is al-masakin. That's the next category. Miskin has come a few times before. Even for Banu Israel, we saw the word al-maskana, which is from the same origin. It's a combination. Sometimes the Arabic language has four letter roots. Most of the time, Arabic words are three letters. They're based out of three letters. And rarely they're made out of four letters. Maskana is actually one of those rare words that is made up of four letters primarily. Meme, Seen, Kaf, and Noon. And when that happens, the theory of some people, like Ibn al-Faris, uh, you know, is that it's actually three and then three. In other words, it's Meme, Seen, and Kaf. That's one word. And then Seen, Kaf, and Noon, Sakana. Masaka and Sakana, those two words fuse together and become Maskana. They, they actually, it's a combination of two words. And if you look at it in that way, then actually from Masaka you get the idea of stopping, and from Sakana you get the idea of staying in one place. And if you combine those two ideas, that's where you get the, you know, the, the sense of a miskin is not just a poor person, but someone stuck in a situation. Someone who lost a job and now can't get another job. Someone who lost their health and now they're in a state that, where they can't, can no longer perform the functions they used to perform before. It's like a taxi driver whose eyesight has gone so bad he can't drive anymore. He's stuck. You know, it's not, he can't do anything about that. This is a miskin. And Allah Azza wa is describing now, uh, you know, that you're going to be the best to the orphans and al-masakin. And al-masakin may be people that, like we, I tried to allude to yesterday, you can't know these people until you congregate and meet with each other. But the miskin is even a more complicated scenario because they may not even be able to leave home. They may not even be able to come. Like you're coming to the masjid to, you know, just say salam, get to know people, etc. But the masakin are the kind of people that may not even have that luxury. They can't even come to, to see you there. So you're going to have to find them out. So there's a kind of diligence involved on behalf of a community, just taking care of your neighbors, checking on people. And if everybody was actually aware of who their neighbors are and what's going on with them, at least just a little bit 
of uh, you know, an acquaintance, then they would know who the Masakeen are. The other interesting thing here in the language that was given to Banu Israel, yes, they were among themselves, but Allah Azza wa did not add minkum. He didn't say, take care of the close relatives, orphans, needy, you know, people stuck in a bad situation who belong within you. He basically opened it up to this is anybody who's an orphan, anybody who's you know, needy. And this is the same thing Allah does for the Muslims in Surah An-Nisa and other places. He, Allah Azza wa Jal, describes these people, people of need, regardless of their religion. So you know, in our mind, sometimes we say, well, if you're going to help, help a Muslim. No, if you're going to help, help someone in need, actually. The earliest revelations of the Qur'an spoke on behalf of people that were being oppressed like الَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوَّزَنُهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ People that are being cheated in the market by business people, they're being shortchanged, they pay $10, they're only getting $9 worth of groceries. So they're being cheated. Allah spoke on behalf of the people being cheated. They weren't Muslim, but Allah still spoke on their behalf. When Allah spoke about the baby girl that's being buried alive, بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ Or, وَلَا يَحُضُّ عَلَى طَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ You know, He doesn't even encourage the feeding of the, of the poor. Or, يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ He pushes the orphan around. When the Qur'an was criticizing the people of Mecca for oppressing people, it wasn't saying al-yatim al-muslim and al-miskeen al-muslim. He's just saying al-yatim, al-miskeen. He's actually criticizing people being, being bothered, people being oppressed, people being overlooked. And that's a responsibility the ummah has. Like, it's not their problem. And like when we think of the, the people that deserve our sadaqah, our charity, our goodness, you know, that we almost, the, 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 the Christians around us, the Jews around us, the non-Muslims, the Hindus around us are invisible to us. They shouldn't be. There's no reason they should be. As a matter of fact, so long as they're close to you, and if you look at the word al qurba as proximity, people in your neighborhood, people that you know, they deserve goodness from you. And they should be in, in, you know, part of the list of people that you take into consideration. But then when, as the ayah moves forward, it gives us a very simple statement, but a very difficult statement too. He says, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا He says, and say, it, it has it layers of meaning here, one of the base meanings, easiest meaning to understand, say good things to people. Say good things to people. It sounds really simple, but it's really hard. And that's the first meaning is to say good, and it said linnas, to all people. But the word lam, like, qalu lil haqqi lamma ja'ahum hadha sihru mubin in Quran, the lam with qal can also mean about. It doesn't just mean to, it also means about. So say good things to people and say good things about people. Now, when you're saying good things to people, they're in your face. Hey, how are you? How's it going? Glad to see you. But then they leave and then you start talking against them. I hate that guy. You were just smiling at him. Salam. How's your Ramadan going? And as soon as he turns around, you're just, you know. And the same thing with even non-Muslims. Hey, Frank, good to see you at the office. And they turn around, hey, he's kuffar. You know, like. Kulu lin nasi husnan. Talk nicely to people, talk in a beautiful way to people, and talk in a beautiful way about people. That's the two things so far. Then the word husnan could be a maf'ul bihi, and it could also be a hal. If it's a maf'ul bihi, you say, what should you say to people? Good things. Of all the things you could say, talk to people, say good things about them. If you don't have something good to say, don't say anything. If you don't have something good to say about someone, don't say anything. But on the other hand, if it's looked at as hal, say good things, but say them in a nice way. The, the idea of hal is not just what you do, but how you do it. The way you speak. You know, it's very easy to say something good, but not say it in a good way. <laughs> That's very easy to do. I've given you silly examples of that before, like a horrible way of saying assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Like, it's, not, it's a good thing to say, but you didn't say it in a good way. Husnan is both a maf'ul bihi and a hal, capturing both ideas. Say good things to people and say, the, say them beautifully. Say them well, because you know, you, you can actually say good things sarcastically also. Oh, thanks a lot. That's not thanks, you know. Oh, really appreciate it. Jazakallahu <laughs> khairan. That's not a jazakallah, you know. That's one side of hustan, but not the other side of it. It's a very powerful, comprehensive statement. But what is it doing here? And if, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to illustrate to you in the sequence of the ayat that are coming. 
how this plays such a, such a vital role. We're just coming out of a story with the Israelites having killed one of their own. You know, and we live in a day and age where we have not just seen the murder of individuals, we've seen the murder of thousands, wars breaking out, and enormous amounts of hate. Just in this month of Ramadan, you may have followed the news, how many hate crimes have been committed against Muslims across the country. There's a flurry of them. You know, people, and, and I urge all of you to be careful and your families to be careful as well. People just being attacked on their way to the masjid. And the police are still not sure after hearing this guy say, you Muslim, da 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 da, hit the guy in front of him. We're not sure if it's a hate crime. You, you're, you're not sure if it's a hate crime. You're the same police who is pretty sure that that 10 year old or 12 year old African American boy playing in the playground is carrying a machine gun. So open fire on him, and they're not sure this is a hate crime. The, the double standards, you know, when, they, when it comes to pulling the trigger and when it comes to, you know, showing some, some level of justice, subhanAllah. But regardless, this is a time where a lot of hatred has been brewed and people are now taking matters in their own hand. But you know both ways, whether Muslims commit acts of aggression or non-Muslims commit acts of aggression, you know what the root of it is, right? Words, rhetoric, propaganda. Sp spreading hatred about people, saying bad things to people and saying bad things about people will eventually take the most emotionally unstable within society and get them to do crazy things. It all begins with words. When, you, when you're able to apply قُولُ لِلنَّاسِ husnan, then you save the world a lot of trouble. It's not a small principle. Speak nicely to people, speak nicely about people. And speak in a way that is kind, that is beautiful. It's, a, it's not a small principle. But let's look within ourselves. Let's look at the mirror because it's hard to look at the mirror. Uh, we ourselves, the Muslim community, just like the Israelites, they were, and by the way, some say this was their leaders being told. Their leaders were being told. In other words, they're, of that time, they're imams. When they were taken up to the mountain, they were being told, speak nicely to people and about people. Why? Because when people are in a position of leadership, they're in a position of influence. And they can actually influence you to hate a bunch, uh, bunch of people or love a bunch of people or to further your antagonism towards a bunch of people. When you use this platform to spread rumors about people, to spread, you know, these people, they're not even true Muslims, they don't even follow the right way of Islam, they're actually mushrik as far as we're concerned, they're kafir, they're munafiq, they're deviant, they're, they spread poison about another group of people. What happens to a large population? They start developing, Muslims start developing hatred among each other. Because I listen to this gang and you listen to that gang. And this, this gang mentality is formed within the Ummah, within religious circles. Within religious circles. So much you know, poison being said about each other. People, now, now we've come to a point where people are walking into a masjid and if you're a regular at a masjid, first you kind of take a quick look and see if he belongs within, your, you know, within the rightly guided. Or is he one of the 72 that's going to burn in hell? And you can check that by the clothes He's wearing, or the length of the beard, or, you know, you might be able to tell by the way he raised his hands and made takbir, ah, oh, this one's going to hell, this salah didn't even count. <laughs> Whether or not he's got leather socks on or not, how high his pants are, you know, you just scope, scope him out. And this poor guy needs help. And this kind of, this kind of judgmental behavior, it's even become subconscious. It's become subconscious, it's so disgusting, you know. And this all starts with what? قُولُوا nasi. And it's about people in general. Give people benefit of the doubt and say kind things about people. And if you understand that as a principle that was given to the Israelites, and by extension is now, because it's being mentioned in Qur'an, Allah does not mention things about previous nations in the Qur'an unless they are of value to us also. Allah is not interested in just telling us history and say, oh, that was for them, we don't have to do the nasi husdan. This is for Bani Israel. Uh, genius, this Qur'an is hudan lil muttaqeen. This is not a book that is tarikhan lil muttaqin. It's not a history book. Oh, interesting facts about the Jews. Interesting facts about the Christians. No. This is about you and I and what we're supposed to live up to now. That's what we're being told. So Allah took this contract from them and as a result, we have to now uphold speaking to people in a way that is right. Now, now notice what he says next. He says, wa aqimu salata wa atu zakah. Establish the prayer and give the zakah. The fundamentals of sharia that are now, that were maintained, that were given to Musa alayhi salam, 
and are now the tasdeeq of them, the confirmation of them is done in the sharia given to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa What was in Torah is now in Quran. Aqimu salah wa atu zakah. This is not a new thing that they always had it. The iqamah of salah and the giving of zakah. Now if that's the case, why is it second? Where did the conversation begin? Worship only Allah. Take care of your parents. Take care of close relatives. Be the best you can be to close relatives. To orphans. And then, you know, and then on top of that, masakeen, people who can't help themselves. And then when it comes to speaking, make sure you speak to people and about people nicely and in a nice way. Oh, and by the way, also establish salah and give zakah. When you think about being religious today, somebody thinks about being religious, the first thing is fix your salah, everything else will come. Allah says, yes, worship to Allah is critical. But when you truly become a abd of Allah, it shows... It reflects in how you deal with people, starting with the people closest around you, and then that circle enhances and enhances. And it certainly manifests in the way you talk to people. I see another wisdom here, Allah Ta'ala A'lam, that when you learn to talk to people and talk about people in a nice way, where do you establish salah? Where is salah established? In the masjid. If you haven't developed the habit of talking nicely about or to people, and you come and pray, what do you create in the masjid? You create fitna. You create opposing board members, elections, committees, fights, accusations, slander, nasty emails. This is what you create. You create email chains about this one is, we need to fire the imam or do this with that board member or this and that. Oh my God. All of it because you don't know how to speak. So Allah actually precedes it. Before you come and establish salah, fix the way you talk to and about people. وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَأَعْتُ الزَّكَةِ ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ Even after all of that, you turned away. You turned your backs. وَأَنْتُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِّنْكُمْ Except very, very few among you. Allah is still not willing to say that all of you became this way. But Allah is giving a history lesson now about the Israelites. Most of, them turned, most of you turned away. And then very few among you. وَأَنْتُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ and this last part, some has looked at as hal. I actually like to look at this as isti'naf. Hal means you turned away while the majority of you were ignoring it, ignoring these instructions. But I like to think that this is a transition over to the people of Medina. The covenant was taken back in the day. But by the end of this ayah, Allah is saying, most of you turned away, or you turned away except very few of you, and you, the Jews that are in front of the Prophet in Medina, most of you are ignoring it still. You are ignoring it still. So it's actually a commentary not just on history but on current events as they are taking place in the city of Medina. وَإِذَا خَذْنَا مِثَاقَكُمْ لَا تَسْفِكُونَ دِمَاءَكُمْ When we took the contract from you, when we took the agreement from you, the, when we issued the commandments to you that you won't be spilling your blood. Now listen, the Ten Commandments as the Bible has it now, as the Jews had it, the summary of it is you, sh you, know, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make idols, you shall not make, take the, the name of the Lord in vain. That's why actually for a lot of uh, traditional Orthodox Jewish factions and schools of thought, they can't even pronounce the name of God. Only the high priest in the temple and inside the temple can pronounce his name. It's uh, commonly, you may have heard the word Yahweh, or it's, it's you know, Y-V-H-W. But it's, nobody knows how to pronounce it because the temple was destroyed and the high priest was killed, etc. So they just have those symbols, but they say you shouldn't even say his name. Look at what, how, how this equation has been flipped. You have in our deen, وَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Keep mentioning Allah a lot. Everything you say has the word Allah in it. Astaghfirullah, subhanallah, masha'Allah, insha'Allah. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Everybody, know, everybody here knows this stuff whether you know Arabic or not. The word Allah makes its way into everything you say. And they had flipped this equation, even the word Allah is so sacred that you can't even use it. Actually, the original intent was, you won't say it in a blasphemous way. You won't say things like, إِنَّ اللَّهَ فَقِيرٌ وَنَحْنُ أَغْنِيَا Allah is bankrupt, we are the ones that are rich. You know, you won't speak of Allah in this way. But they, you know, they turned it into, you can't even pronounce God's name. You know, it, 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 completely not the intent of the text. But anyway, you know, you, you'll remember the Sabbath, and we, we learned about the Sabbath, that's mentioned in the Qur'an also. You'll honor your father and your mother. We just saw what? Wabil walidayni, ihsanan. So we have that in there too. You shall not murder. And then he says, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet. And then covet your neighbor's wife, there's a, there's a number of covet, meaning you're not, you're not going to pursue the, the rights of your neighbor, you're not going to seize and wrong your neighbor 
or commit zina with the neighbor's wife, etc., etc. Those are the additional commandments that were given to them. But Allah in the Quran highlights a number of them, a key number of them. We've already seen not worshipping anyone other than Allah and goodness to parents. But now he's highlighting something about the infighting of the Israelites. As a religious community, they were supposed to be models of how people live in harmony under God. You know, the more, because when, when your heart is at peace with the one who made you, you should be a vessel of peace for everybody around you. Like if, now you're calmed down, you're, you're, you're settled, and you have tamanina, you have you know, this tranquility, and then everybody around you experiences it. This is why Allah says in the Quran, وَفَأَيُّ الْفَرِقَيْنِ أَحَقُّ بِالْأَمْنِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ أَلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبَسُوا إِمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمٍ Which of the two groups do you think deserves peace more? Safety, security more? If you don't know. And if in fact you know. It's those who believe. Because once you believe, the, the tranquility descends from a lie in your heart. And as a result, you become a tranquil per person to the people around you. You know? When you're disturbed, you create disturbance. When you're at peace, you resonate peace. It vibrates out of you. That's the vibe people get around you. So Allah says here to them, when we took the covenant from you, لا تسفكون دماءكم You're not going to be spilling your blood. That's an interesting language. You won't be spilling your own blood. Who spills their own blood? Is this saying you're not going to commit suicide? No, actually this is the Qur'an's way, unique expression, your own self is used a number of times in the Qur'an. We saw it already, فَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Which didn't mean kill yourselves, meant kill your own people. Kill your own people. Here, لَا تَسْفِكُونَ دِمَاءَكُمْ means don't spill your own people's blood. Don't spill the blood of your, own, your, your brethren. You know, your fellow children of Israel, your, your brothers in faith. Don't kill them. سَلِّمُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ Quran says. When you go to people's homes, literally the expression is so awesome. He says, say salam, extend peace, extend the greeting of peace to yourselves. Wait, you didn't extend it to yourself, you extended it to someone else. But this is the Quran's beautiful way of saying that a faith community, a community of people that believe, they should actually see everyone as they see themselves. Hurting someone else to them should be no different than them seeing them, they're actually hurting themselves. That's how they should, they should see it. This is why even when you do slander, when you accuse somebody and you tarnish somebody's dignity, what does Allah say? You know, لَوْلَا ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا How come believing men and believing women didn't have a better opinion about their own selves? They're, they have a perfectly fine opinion of themselves. They were slandering somebody else. But Allah says, no, actually when you slander and tarnish the dignity of a fellow believer, that is actually you tarnishing yourself, hurting yourself. When you're fighting, even when if the unfortunate case of Muslims fighting each other, Allah Azza wa Jal did not say, taqatalu, fight, to fight one another. He said, iqtatalu, to fight oneself. When believers are fighting themselves. Which sounds absurd, but that's actually the point the Messenger of Allah even brings across وسلم, when he describes this ummah ka jasad. The entire believing community is like a single body. You, it's a, absurd for one of my hands to slice off the other hand. It doesn't make any sense. So when believers fight each other, that's the insanity of someone killing their own selves and that's why this expression is so powerful. You won't spill your own blood. Meaning the blood of a fellow believer is no different from your own blood. You should think of it like yourself. This is why Mir'atul Muslim, right? The Muslim is the mirror of another Muslim. لا تخرجون أنفسكم من ديارikum. And you're not going to expel your own selves, meaning your own people, from your, your, your homes. It's like kicking them out of you know, your own homes. These are your homes altogether. You should think of their property and you should want to be protective of their property just like you would of your own. This is a very simple contract. You won't, you won't kill. akrartum. And all of you, back then when the covenant was taken, all of you had agreed. And then Allah switches the equation again and turns to the Israelites of Medina and says, وَأَنْتُمْ تَشْهَدُونَ And you people are also witness that that, co that covenant had taken place. In other words, Allah is talking about two communities. He's talking about the Israelites under the leadership of Musa salam, under the leadership of Moses, thousands of years ago by the mountain where they are receiving these commandments. And then he's talking about the faction of Jews that live in the city of Medina who are in the company of the Prophet salam, And Allah is reminding them, you are an extension of those people and you also bear witness that that contract was taken, don't you? وَأَنْتُمْ تَشْهَدُونَ And so when Allah says this, 
ابن عاشور رحمه الله the genius of him لأن المخاطبين حين نزول القرآن هم المقصودون من هذه الموعظة the actual addressees of these ayat are not the historical Jews they're the ones of Medina they're the ones meant from Medina now so you're still bearing witness what comment does Allah make now about the people of Medina the rest of these ayat I find it more compelling so I'll share what I find more compelling of what I've read is that they are referring to the Jews and the Jewish community of the city of Medina then you people, you are the very same, aren't you? Ha'ula is not normally used like this. وَهَذَا اِسْتِعْمَالٌ عَرَبِيٌّ يَخْتَصُّ غَالِبًا بِمَقَامِ التَّعَجُّبِ مِنْ حَالِ الْمُخَاطِبِ مِنْ حَالِ الْمُخَاطِبِ In other words, you know, in, are you that same one? You don't normally say that, you know? Like, in, normal, normally nobody else says, أَنَا ذَلِكْ I am that one. But actually the closer thing in English, the sense of it in English is I'm the one they were talking about. That's anadalik. I'm the one they were talking about. Thumma antum, then you people, haula, you are the very same that, that were witnessing, that were witness to the fact that you don't kill your own brother. And what have you done? Taqtuluna anfusakum. You kill your own people? You, the same ones that testified? وَتُخْرِجُونَ فَرِيقًا بِنْكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ And you take a fariq, a broken off group among you, and expel them from their homes. Notice the word fariq here. Allah descri describes their process. First, you describe an element from within the community. All of the Israelites of the time, we consider the Muslims of that time. So they're all Muslim. First, they demonize one group among them and say, these people are not even an, part of our ummah. They're a firqa. They're a fariq. They don't belong with us. And you create enough hatred towards them that the rest of the people will start thinking they're nothing but kafir. And once they're nothing but kafir, it's okay to kill them or kick them out of their homes. That's no problem. So you kick them out of their homes. <laughs> you so easily transgress against them with sin and animosity. You, you do this egregious penalty against Allah. That's the ifm. And then the udwan is, and you, you have now seen them as your own enemy. You have no mercy towards these people. وَإِيَأْتُكُمْ usara tufaduhum, And when they come to you as slaves, then you want to pay their ransom and free them. This seems contradictory. We're first, these it's a group of people that are trying to kill some people. And then they're so bad towards them, they're even willing to kick them out of their home. And show the worst animosity and do all kinds of sins. It's all okay. No, nothing is haram to do to these people. We can do our way with them because they're all you know, from the devil anyway. And then after you do all of that and you see them as refugees, you see them as you know, people that have been taken prisoner, and they come to you in the state of being imprisoned, then you have fundraisers to try to rescue them and pay for them, and humanitarian crisis, that's what you do next. Tufaduhum. وَهُوَ مُحَرَّمٌ عَلَيْكُمْ إِخْرَاجُهُمْ And it was explicitly forbidden upon you to kick them out in the first place. Now I won't go for the rest of the ayah yet. We have to stop here and really just kind of understand what is going on here in this ayah. What, what is this talking about? I'll read to you the commentary of Ibn Ashur and translate it and explain it along the way. Wal-Adhar, what seems to be the most obvious. Anna al-Maqsuda, Yahudu Qurayda, wa Nadir, wa Qaynuqa. That this, the intent here is actually the Jewish tribes in Medina of Qurayda, Banu Qurayda, Banu Nadir, and Qaynuqa. وَأَرَادَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ بِخَاصَّةِ مَا حَدَثَ بَيْنَهُمْ فِي حُرُوبِ بُعَاثَ الْقَائِمَةِ بَيْنَ الْأَوْسِ وَالْخَزْرَجِ And this is actually referring to incidents that took place called the, the, the wars of Bu'ath, that's the name of them, that took place between the tribes of Aus and Khazraj. Aus and Khazraj being the dominant tribes of Medina before the Prophet moved there. Now, وَذَلِكَ أَنَّهُ لَمَّا تَقَاتَلَ الْأَوْسُ وَالْخَزْرَجِ So Aus and Khazraj, these two tribes used to fight each other all the time. Okay, they, before the Prophet came there, even Medina had internal problems. So they used to fight each other all the time. اعتزل اليهود الفريقين زمنا طويلا For a long time, the Jews had actually separated themselves from both tribes. والأوس مغلوبون في سائر أيام القتال And Aus, so the two tribes that fight in Medina are Aus and Khazraj. And the Jews are keeping a distance. They're like, oh, we don't want nothing to do with this. So they're staying away. Aus used to be the one that used to lose most of the time. فَدَبَّرَ الْأَوْسِ أَنْ يَخْرُجُوا يَسْعَوْنَ لِمُحَالَفَةِ قُرَيْدَ وَالنَّضِيرِ So Aus had a thought, maybe if we had more allies, we could beat Khazraj. So we'll go to the Jewish tribes and take a pledge of allegiance from them 
an oath from them and they'll jump in with us and we'll band our forces together and then take on Khazraj. فَلَمَّا عَلِمَ الْخَزْرَجْ تَوَعَّدُ الْيَهُودِ إِنْ فَعَلُوا ذَلِكَ فَقَالُوا لَهُمْ And when, when Khazraj found out that the Aus are thinking about making these treaties with the Jewish communities, Khazraj came to uh, Aus. Or Khazraj rather came to uh, both of those tribes and said, إِنْ فَعَلُوا ذَلِكَ فَقَالُوا لَهُمْ If you were to do this, here's what we say to them. إِنَّا لَا نُحَالِفُ الْأَوْسِ وَلَا نُحَالِفُكُمْ فَطَلَبَ الْخَزْرَجْ عَلَى الْيَهُودِ رَهَائِنَا أَرْبَعِينَ غُلَامًا That's crazy. So, so Khazraj went and said, you can't make treaties with Aus. And they got scared. He said, fine, we won't make any treaties with you, and we won't make any treaties with them. We don't want to get involved. So then Khazraj, because they're a powerful tribe, they said, we want a guarantee. Give us 40 of your boys. 40 of the young boys, let us hold them hostage. Because if you try to break your treaty, we'll kill these boys. So 40 of these kids from the Jewish tribes were taken. From, from both, uh, 40 altogether, from Nadira, Banu Nadira, Banu, Banu uh, Quraida. Okay. Min Ghilmani Quraida wa Nadir. Fasalimuhum lahum. So they gave them up. They gave those boys up. Thumma inna Amr ibn al-Nu'man al-Bayadi al-Khazraji atma'a qawmahu an yatahawalu li Quraida wa Nadir li husni ardihim wa nakhlihim. Then one of the leaders of Khazraj said, now we have these boys, which are kind of hostage, now we have leverage against these guys. Why don't we ask them for their land? Why don't we just take over? And so they went back and said, listen, uh, we want your land and your homes. And if not, we'll kill these boys. That was the deal made. And so when they struck this deal, إِلَىٰ قُرِيدَ وَالنَّظِيرِ يَقُولُ لَهُمْ إِمَّا أَن تَخْلُوا لَنَا دِيَارَكُمْ وَإِنَّا أَن نَقْتُلَ الرَّهَائِنِ Either you leave your homes or we kill these, these boys that are being held hostage. فَخَشِيَ الْقَوْمَ عَلَىٰ رَهَائِنِهِمْ وَاسْتَشَارُوا كَعْبِ ibn أُسَيْدَ الْقُرَضِ So the nation was, the, the two tribes were scared that their, their children would be killed. So they sought the counsel of a man named Ka'b ibn Usaid al-Qurdi. And this guy gave the most epic advice, stupid. يَا قَوْمْ إِمْنَعُوا دِيَارَكُمْ People, don't let them take your homes. وَخَلُّوهُ يَقْتُلُوا الْغِلْمَانِ And let them kill the boys. فَمَا هِيَ إِلَّا لَيْلَ يُصِيبُ أَحَدَكُمْ فِيهَا إِمْرَأَتَهُ حَتَّى يُولَدْ لَهُ مِثْلَ أَحَدِهِمْ There's no big deal, you just have to spend another night with your wives, you'll get pregnant, you'll have another kid. Land was far more important. An insight into the, psych the sick psyche. The value of human life as opposed to the value of what? Land. And they actually followed along. فَلَمَّا أَجَابَتْ قُرِيدَ وَالنَّظِيرَ عَمْرًا بِأَنَّهُمْ يَمْنَعُونَ دِيَارَهُمْ عَدَى عَمْرُ عَلَى الْغِلْمَانِ So, فَقَتَلَهُمْ فَذَلِكَ تَحَالَفَتْ قُرِيدَ وَالنَّظِيرَ مَعَ الْأَوْسِ And so he, they killed the boys. And that's when the Jewish tribes actually sided with Aus because Khazraj had killed their boys and they sided. And then, فَسَعَ الْخَزْرَجْ فِي مُحَالَفَةِ بَيْنُ قَيْنُقَعْ مِنَ الْيَهُودِ And then Khazraj said, fine, you get these two Jewish tribes, I'll go side with the other Jewish tribe, بَيْنُ قَيْنُقَعْ And they kept having infighting for five years before the Prophet ﷺ had come to Medina. So some Jewish tribes were aligned with Aus, the other Jewish tribes were aligned with Khazraj, and they would fight each other and kill each other all the time. And then sometimes they would actually see that the other, like, you know, they're not, it's, think of it this way, it's imagine like, you know, the US and the Russians are at, at war and some allies of the US are Muslim and some allies of the Russians are Muslim but when they see Muslims being taken prisoner from the other side they say we should set them free they're our Muslim brothers you're allied and you're fighting them and as a result they've been imprisoned and impoverished and now you're having fundraisers for them yeah yeah I know but we're, they're still our Muslim brothers we should still you know help them out and so what they used to do is, musara tufaduhum. This was happening in Medina. And when they used to come to you as prisoners, from the wrong, from the wrong ally, you would give their ransom and free them. And it was haram on you to join the enemy and kill them in the first place. To be in bed with their enemy in the first place. And the, the Quraysh used to actually, فَعَيَّرَتِ الْعَرَبُ الْيَهُودِ بِذَلِكَ كَيْفَ تُقَاتِلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ تُفْدُونَهُمْ بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ the rest of the Arabs just say, you guys don't understand loyalty? They're not even Muslim. The Arabs are just tribal people. They understand loyalty. They're like, we don't get it. You guys kill your own and then you free them? Which is it? I understand that you're enemies now. Just stay enemies. But why are you helping them out later too? <laughs> we don't understand this hypocrisy. Now let's take a step back. This is about the contemporary kind of schizophrenia 
that this community was facing because of their political complications back then in the Prophet's time. We, of course, the Muslims of today, have no such problems. So, <laughs> where we never, ever actually spread any hateful speech about any other group of Muslims. We never declare any other group kafir or deviant or we're never okay with the spilling of the blood of someone who sees Islam differently than we do. We would never do that. We would never actually be okay. We're, we would be only, that, that one time, we'd only be offended if people from our school of thought and our version of Islam, uh, if they're oppressed, this is an oppression against Islam. But when somebody else's school of thought and their people are being killed and slaughtered and kicked out of their homes, that's okay, they deserve it. They're shayateen anyway. Do you know what they say about you know, the Qur'an? Do you know what they say about the Prophet Do you know what they do with Hadith? Do you know what they do with the Sahaba? Do you know what they do with this? Justify it. It's okay. They're not human, obviously. They're a fariq. They're deviant. They deserve to die. We would never do that. We are a disgusting example of what happened with the Israelites. I'm sorry to say, it hurts. It hurts. This differences of opinion will always exist. There will be strong differences of opinion. There were people who I, I read, I study, for example, when I'm studying tafsir, I study, when I study grammar and the language of an ayah, I'm studying Zamakhshari. Zamakhshari is a very famous Mu'tazili. Al-Kashaf is a Mu'tazili tafsir. He's, and and the, the Mu'tazilites, they call them in English literature, a lot of their views are not mainstream views of Islam. They're not. I don't accept them. But this scholar is a gold standard of linguistic analysis of the Qur'an. People that came afterwards, after him, and bashed him, and cursed him, and called, warned people against him, still took his grammatical analysis, and didn't even give credit, but would you know, copy the entire paragraph line by line. And you're reading a tafsir from three centuries later, and the entire passage is quoted, and then he's doing a, you know, an entire naqd of, of uh, Zamakhshari, and you're like, dude, homeboy, just at least give credit. You didn't even put it in quotes. You made it sound like you wrote it. That ain't cool. And you know what? Differences of opinion can be very strong sometimes. There are people I don't agree with. I completely disagree with. There are people today that believe that there's a prophet after Rasulullah Ma'adullah. I will never accept that. I don't think that's Islam at all. But to me, does that mean that it's okay to kill these people or to call them shaitan or to... What are you talking about? Where did you get that from? Are we not capable of civil, calm disagreement? And to be able to present our evidences and say, here's why I think your position is incorrect. These are the evidences of which I am convinced. You can bring forth your evidences, and at the end of the day, you'll have to decide for yourself, and I'll have to decide for myself. Do I have to call for your killing? Do I have to call for you to be demonized and turned into a devil? Think about what the Messenger of Allah did Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we, by the way, most of the time we, we disagree on little things. We disagree on little things. Yeah, some things are big, but mostly in the grand scheme of things, they're little. And as opposed to that, our disagreement, for example, with the people of the Christian faith. Our, our theological differences with our Christian brothers and sisters are much bigger than any Muslims within themselves. These are people, a, a, a huge denomination of them believes Jesus is the Son of God. Here you have a faith, Islam, that says God has no son, no father. Absolutely not. Jesus is a messenger of God and a miracle of God and a manifestation of His Word, but not the Son of God. You couldn't be further apart. And that, that humanity has, or those who believe, their sins have been paid for with the blood of Jesus. And we say no. Sins can only be paid for by your own deeds and on top of that, God's forgiveness. Above and beyond anything else, but not by the blood of another person. Where, where human beings are born into sin. We say no, all human beings are born naturally. On goodness, They're, we're predisposed to be good. And we're not paying for the sins of our father. That is not the case of humanity. We couldn't be more different. And yet when the Christians, a group of them heard that a man named Muhammad claims to be a prophet, and they wanted to come visit him. And they came from Najran, they came to visit him, spent a few days with him. The Prophet ﷺ says, there were no hotels back then. They say, hey, there's a holiday over there, you could stay there. They stayed in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And these were priests. These were high priests. They prayed to Jesus in the mosque. The entire time they were there. They engaged in their acts of worship in the mosque. 
And this line that Allah always drew, but Muslims somehow forgot, because the Israelites had forgotten and we followed into those footsteps, we have forgotten. What is that line? When somebody says something blasphemous, Christians say God has a son. Is that something that angers Allah in the Quran? Absolutely. Absolutely. وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدًا لَقَدْ جِئْتُمْ شَيْئًا إِبْدًا They said, Ar-Rahman has taken a son? You've said a monstrous thing, Allah says. He doesn't take it lightly. He talks about the entire heavens ripping open because of what you say. Anytime someone says God has a son, according to the Qur'an, the heavens are about to rip open from the blasphemy of the statement. That's how angry God gets. And that same God, but that's a, by the way, that's a Makki Surah, Surah Maryam. It's a Makki Surah. It's already been revealed how angry Allah is at that statement. And the Prophet ﷺ already knows how angry Allah gets at that statement. And knowing that, he invites these Christians where? In Al-Masjid al nabawi And they pray to Jesus inside the Masjid. And it's fine. Why? Why is that fine? I'm going to give you a silly example so you don't forget why it's fine. I'm a father of seven children. I'm upset, imagine I'm upset at one of my daughters, the eldest daughter. And I'm telling her, you told me you'll finish your homework by four, you haven't even started. What's wrong with you? And my youngest daughter, Iman, comes along next to me and says, yeah, what's wrong with you? <laughs> All of a sudden, I am no longer upset with Husna. Who am I upset with? Iman. Who are you? <laughs> Did my anger somehow give you license to be angry? Excuse me? Are you the parent all of a sudden? Know your place, child. You don't get to be angry on behalf of me. Just because I'm upset, you don't have the authority. You don't have the place. Allah is angry at someone. And what do we do when we read Quran? Allah is angry at someone. What, what position do we assume? <laughs> yeah. We're mad too. Excuse me? He is Allah. He can be angry at whoever he wants. You, on the other hand, are a slave. Remain a slave. You have to know your place. This is what the seerah itself teaches us of our messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so, when religious texts are taken to show how angry God is at some people, and then to use that to create hatred and anger towards those people, people don't even realize they themselves are engaged in an act of blasphemy. They are, be, they are taking something, the, the ghadab of Allah, that is only, bef, it, only appropriate for Him. It's not becoming of us. And we, we assume it for ourselves. We take the license ourselves. This is the ultimate crime. And so, you transgress against them. First you make them into a deviant faction. Demonize them, turn them into a devil. Look, I can disagree. We can totally disagree. I, I'm friends with rabbis. I disagree. I couldn't disagree with them more. I have a few pastors that are my friends. We are completely in disagreement on most things. But it's still cool. We can eat pizza together. It's fine. We can talk. It's not a problem. And it's not like I believe in what I believe any less. Or they believe in what they believe any less. But we can still be civil and harmonious towards one another. We can still do that, you know. We don't have to turn everything into a life and death thing, you know. They don't, and I, I've asked some of them flat out. So do you believe, because I'm Muslim, do you believe that I'm not going to make it to heaven? And they say, yeah, I do believe that. I believe you're not going to make it to heaven. I still like you though. I'm like, okay. But I respect your honesty. And just because, and, and then he, they'll tell me flat out, but, but heaven and hell is for God to decide. We're here right now. Let's let, just leave that to God. That's fine. We can't forget doing that with non-Muslims. We can't even do that with Muslims. This is what the Israelites were being told. You kill each other. You create rhetoric that creates hate. And that hate then boils over. And then when it boils over enough, it turns into civil war and murder and pillaging and, and genocide. How many Muslims have been killed at the hands of other Muslims in just the last century? Just the last century. And how much of that has to do with the hate that was taught from the member? How much of it? These people have blood on their hands. Blood on their hands. Both sides. Either, however many groups there are. It's ridiculous. 
This happens in Pakistan, this happens in the Arab world, in, the, in Bangladesh, and all over the Muslim world, this kind of ignorance. This is what Allah left behind? This is the deen that's supposed to be a model for humanity? Shame on us. Allah says, And then we have you know, relief organizations, poor organizations come forward, there are refugees here, there, there are refugees there, there, there's a crisis here, there's your orphans here. Who made those orphans? Who made those orphans? The vast majority of the time, it's Muslims who made those orphans. Muslims who created those refugees. And we collectively have this hypocrisy within us. And if you're not the one who pulled the trigger, fine. But if you're the one who ran your mouth and are part of perpetuating that hatred, then you're part of the same filthy machine. You're part of the same. Qulul and nasi husnan came first. Then the ayat of not spilling blood came. Because when you don't watch your mouth, the next thing that happens is blood is spilled. When you let Trump run his mouth the way he does, then you get these kinds of incidents. When you allow this kind of hateful rhetoric to spread, then eventually psychosis takes over. And that even happens within the Muslim community. So if you and I are, are you know, infected with this kind of rhetoric, this kind of talk about other Muslims, about other schools of thought, about other imams, groups, communities, countries, nations, if that's what we've become, Allah help us. And we're as much a criminal. You, you think that their deviation makes them a criminal? You spelling, spilling this kind of, and, and spreading this kind of foul, poisonous hatred is, is just as bad, if not worse. If not worse. And what does Allah call all of this? أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ You believe in some parts of the book and deny other parts of the book. Other what, what, what is that doing here? I thought this was about brotherhood and because all the ayat you can use to spread hate, you will quote. And the rest of the ayah that will balance the equation, you will skip. You can actually take selective quotes and pile them together and give a very powerful khutbah. All of it is made up of ayat and a hadith. And the conclusion of it is, you have to hate this group of people. You have to hate them. Well, how couldn't, why couldn't you? Why wouldn't you? And all of the hadith, all of the ayat, all of the historical evidences that will counter that claim, you'll just conveniently skip. If that's not kufr of some parts of the ayat, if, if what else is it? Now you have people that are so insane that if you counter their argument and you say, you are quoting this from the Qur'an, but you're not looking at it in its context, what about this ayah and this ayah and this ayah? They'll say, no, no, all these ayat are mansukh, they don't even count. They're abrogated, cancelled, nullified. MashaAllah. Where did you get your nullification license? That you just open the Qur'an and anything that doesn't agree with your sick theory, you get to cross off from the book of Allah? Calling something mansukh is a small matter? It's a joke? You get to say that Allah's words don't apply? <laughs> is that, you know, the, 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 um, the, the amount of like jur'ah, the amount of like really bravery, I don't even know what to call it. How daring do you have to be to speak, hold on to your opinion, and you're willing to put down the word of Allah and say, no, that doesn't apply. My theory does. Wow. People, when they spill, especially when it comes to spilling the blood of fellow Muslims, will be noticed the theory that is being explained in the Quran. It applies 100% of the time. They will be selective in what they quote from the religion. Absolutely. There will be parts of the religion they just don't want to talk about. They won't even quote it. And if you do quote it to them, they'll say it doesn't apply. What happens to people when they fall sick of this kind of disease? Within an ummah. What happens to this ummah? What would be the payback of anyone who does that among you? Except khizi, humiliation, that's the meaning of khizi. Khizi means someone who falls into degradation and evil and gets known for it. His reputation becomes ruined. He's humiliated wherever he turns. The ummah will be a source of, will be an object of ridicule and humiliation. Everywhere they go, the word Muslim will become a dirty word. It'll become a curse. That's what happens to people within this ummah that do this, they spread this, this khizi. Khazar rajul, sasahu wa qaharahu. Khazar as a verb also means that people that are taken over 
and overcome by other people. What should be your payback other than other people will always overcome you? They will always rule over you. They'll always govern over you. They'll always invade you, if not politically, they'll invade you culturally. They'll invade you emotionally. You know, you won't feel like a civilized human being unless you dress like them and talk like them. You will have no self-integrity left. This is khizi. Al-khuzu kaffu nafs an hammatiha wa sabrun ala, you know, murr al-haq. And then khizi also means bad things keep happening to you and you can't even respond. That's part of the meaning of khizi. That stuff happens to you all the time and you just, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to say and you just keep getting... How much more alive can these ayat become? إِلَّا خِزْيٌ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ شَدِّ الْعَذَابِ And if that wasn't enough, then on the day of resurrection, they will be rejected and thrown back to the most intense, the worst of all punishment. وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ And Allah is not at all unaware of what you're up to. This, incredibly, was a criticism of the Jewish community of Medina. They were killing each other and made Allah so angry. They weren't even Muslim. They weren't even Muslim at the time. They weren't even accepting the Prophet ﷺ. And Allah was so angry at them for violating the word that they had with them, the Torah. Allah is not even criticizing them for shortchanging the Qur'an. Allah is telling them they're not even living up to Torah that they have that's been distorted after the distortion, it's still there that you shall not kill and look at you killing each other for political reasons, for you know, nationalistic reasons, for economic reasons, because of your insane rhetoric, you know, the hatred that you've spilled among each other. This is what made Allah so angry at them. Can you imagine? They have bits and pieces of the revelation left that Allah had given them, the Torah, after it's gone through so many renditions. What does Allah think of a people that have Qur'an and do this? <laughs> the Torah, يُحَرِّفُونَهُ مِن بَعْدِ مَا عَقَلُوهُ They edited it, they altered it even after having understood it. Qur'an you can't even alter. Qur'an is exactly what it was, what it is. It hasn't changed. What do you think becomes our fate? Why do you and I think that there's a, you know, when people ask the silly question, why are the Muslims humiliated today? Why don't we have a say? We're, so, we're, we're a fourth, a fifth of the world's population and we have no say. Why is everybody ridiculing us and mocking us and put, looking down on us? Uh, ayah number 85. Just ayah number 85. That's all, that's all I got for you. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ اشْتَرَوُ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا بِالْآخِرَةِ فَلَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمُ الْعَذَابِ Those are the people that have given away the afterlife for worldly life itself. They've purchased worldly life in exchange for the afterlife. In other words, they had the afterlife with them. They had it. What was, what was so hard about قُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَحْتُوا الزَّكَاءَ What was so hard about that? Just worship Allah, be good to people, be good to your family. That's all it was, wasn't it? You couldn't do that. You, that wasn't enough for you. You had to run your mouth. You had to spread hate until it would create war. You had to do You had akhirah in your hands, guys. You just let it go. And you just wanted some, some gain of this world. Why do people spread hateful messages? It's so pathetic why they do. It's nothing more than sometimes some economic interest. Sometimes it's low self-esteem. We need to prove that we're better than that group or that group. That's all. Self, you know, insecurities. فَلَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمُ الْعَذَابُ وَلَا هُمْ يُنصَرُونَ Then punishment will not be lightened from those people. You know, because the Muslims thought, Abhi, I just Urdu. Just a few minutes, few, few ayat ago, yesterday I told you, their assumption was, fire will touch us, yes, but for how long? Just a few days, it's okay. Yeah, we mess up, but you know, we're Muslim at the end of the day. Allah says, these criminals who spread hate in the world, who spill blood in the world, لا يخفف عنهم العذاب Punishment will not be lightened from them. There will be no decrease in intensity of punishment. ولا هم ينصرون They're not the ones that are going to be aided in any way, shape or form. This, by the way, as I close today, is an echo of something that was mentioned earlier in Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah created Adam. Adam was about to be put on the earth. And the angels had a concern, and the concern was, 
yufsidu fiha wa yasfiku dima He will cause corruption in the land and he will spill blood. And the people Allah chose on the earth to prove them wrong were the people he gave revelation to. And of those people, he gave more revelation than anyone else to Banu Israel. And so he gave them that revelation, and then he echoed the words of the angels, you will not be spilling blood, as the concern of the angels was that you will be spilling blood. You will show the world what it means not to spill blood. You will be the model of peace in the world. And thumma antum ha'ula'i, here you are, you people, the very same, still killing your own selves. Now they were given more revelation than anybody else, but no one was given a powerful a revelation as the Qur'an. And so the final commandment of Allah to humanity, that humanity's the thirst for blood shall come to a close, and the angels will finally be proven wrong, was supposed to be carried out by this model nation called the Ummah of Muhammad We are supposed to be the people that demonstrate what it means to be a peaceful society. And like a, a harmonious society. This is what we're supposed to be. And so this fell on us. They failed it, so it fell on us. Now it's on us. لا تسفكون دماءكم ولا تخرجون أنفسكم من دياركم ثم أقررتم وأنتم تشهدون It is why Allah says إنما المؤمنون إخوة Believers are nothing but brothers. فأصليحوا بين أخويكم Make peace between your brothers. And so as this is echoed, we are supposed to be the people that prove the angels wrong. And Allah has confidence in this ummah. He believes in this ummah. We were chosen for a reason. He sees you qualified, so He chose you. Because He told the angels, I know what you don't know. I know what you don't know. After all the disappointments we've shown Allah for a millennium and a half, Allah is still not replacing us. Allah says, إِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ if you turn your backs, he'll replace you with a nation other than yourselves. Not hard for Allah to do. They'll be nothing like you. They'll prove themselves. The fact that he hasn't replaced us yet, he's giving us a chance. Don't test his patience. The principles of Allah don't change. When a people that were given this great gift of revelation don't live by it, all Allah does is replace them. Another nation comes and takes their place. There will be people that will come and, you know, subhanAllah, you'll notice around us, there are those brothers and sisters that have taken shahada. They've become Muslim. They don't come from a Muslim background. Some of them were agnos, atheists, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists. And they're some of the best Muslims there are. And you look at them and you feel like, man, if all of us were like that, we'd be fine. We'd be all right. SubhanAllah. May Allah Azza wa not make us of those that are replaced. May Allah Azza wa make us take the, the heed from the mistakes of the people that came before us. And may Allah Azza wa make us of those that are a symbol and a model of brotherhood and a spreading of love. Tahabbu. Then tu'minu hatta tahabbu, the Prophet says. You will not believe until you love one another. May Allah Azza wa make us of those who love each other. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.